Welcome to the Marketing for the Culture podcast, powered by the African American Marketing Association. Each week, we'll bring you an insightful conversation from some of the best experts in our industry on how to advance our career. Join the collective of Black marketers across the world, advancing their brand as we work towards creating a collaborative community. Hey, good people. Today's special guest is Reginald Davis. He is the co-founder of Tech for the Culture. So we got marketing and tech for the culture. It's the, I guess, the mashup I've been waiting for. So Reginald, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Michelle, Michelle, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Yeah. So why don't you give us a little background about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. So currently, uh, so my name is Reginald Davis. Uh, I live here in Houston, Texas. Uh, and currently, I am a site reliability engineer for a company called Elastic. Uh, so I work in the cloud. I'm a cloud engineer and I, and I focus on the reliability of our uh, SaaS model. Um, so that's what I do on a day to day. But, you know, in my free time, uh, obviously, I'm working on tech for the culture which is our uh, local group that focuses on uh, helping people kind of go from one to two in their tech careers, uh, not just get in, but also be able to actually drive and advance. And then also I also work for, on a record label called In Crowd Records. So I stay pretty busy. I, I try to keep myself pretty busy. Yeah, that's that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me that's a lot. We I know a little bit about the music scene and then trying to create a community with the organization. So that's a lot. Um, one thing I really want to focus on today is uh, what is tech? Um, I think if you are, I'll just say 40 and under, when we hear the word tech, we think of startup. We think of Google, Facebook, Apple, mm-hmm. or whatever. Right. And we're in Houston. We have obviously oil, gas, energy. Austin is down the street. Um, Dallas has a lot of headquarters as well. So can we can you please define what does tech consist of and the careers that one should consider? Absolutely. So when when you when I start talking about tech or when people start talking about tech, it's it's really interesting conversation to have because Tech is such an ambiguous term, right? Um, because you could be talking about a company that actually builds and develops technology, and that's their product. And you can talk about a company that actually just utilizes technology as their product, and they have all of these other functions that go along with it, right? So whenever you talk about tech, you got to be really, really specific on what kind of company it does and what their actual value add is. So whenever I, you know, when I tell people what tech is, I'm like, okay, like. First off, if if it's a tech company, the tech company is going to have all the same functions as any other regular company. It's just that the end product is technology. So you're still going to have a marketing department. You're still going to have business analytics. You're still going to have HR. You're still going to have the same department as you would any other company. It's just that the end product is going to be technology. So it's going to be some type of software as a service or hardware or something like that. Whereas a lot of other companies are implementing technology or they integrate technology into what they do. So they might leverage technology, they might leverage tools to be able to make a, a easier user experience or to make it uh, easier for, for um, or for them to save overhead or something like that. Uh, but then again, they might have all of these other functions of their business that might not necessarily be tech related, right? So like you might have a slumberjay, they like they, they implement technology, but at the same time, they still got people going in the field, doing this, doing that, doing the things, so on and so forth. So, like, I think it's very, very important to make that delineation between the two, because a lot of times people don't like they just say you if, if, I, if I say I work for tech, they're going to be like, so you build apps. And it's like. No, <laughs> like everybody in tech don't build apps like there's tech is its own world. So, uh, you know, when we talk about tech, I think it's really important to delineate between like what the actual function of the company is, what people are actually doing at the business, what the actual end product is, what the actual end service is, um, before you just go out and be like, oh, man, everybody tech companies. No, no, no. Everybody not a tech company. Look, now, you know, we just worried about our title and our paycheck. Okay. (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
Pretty much. That's all people care about. And how much you get paid, what you do, <laughs> you be coding and stuff. Like, boy, y'all better stop. <laughs> y'all better stop. Um, so let's define, I guess, what is a startup? Because Facebook and Google, they ain't no startups no more. They are dominant, <laughs> dominant figures. Mm-mm. So can you uh, tell us what a startup is? A startup, I, I, this is definitely not going to be in the in the, the Wikipedia or the official definition of a startup. But I'm going to tell you what a startup is to me and based upon my experience. So a startup to me is, number one, they haven't IPO'd yet. They have not IPO'd yet. That's a big one. So they are not a publicly traded company. You cannot go on Robinhood and go buy X amount of shares in this company because they are not a publicly traded company. Um, even a step beyond that, I would say, there's levels to being a startup too, right? Because you got to start up like a Robin Hood, which isn't an IPO, but they're a Robin Hood. And then you might have Joe Schmo startup around the street that might got two people working under it. Yeah, so <laughs> one or two people working under it. So like there, there, there's definitely levels to being a startup. But typically with startups, they're going to be privately funded. They're going to be privately funded companies, right? They're going to be privately funded companies. And it does not necessarily, and the product does not necessarily even have to be a technology product. To be honest with you, I think that's a mis, I think that's a mis, um, I think people misconstrue the idea of startup with app, and that's not actually always the case. You could be a startup and be a mom and pop shop. You know what I'm saying? Like around on a corner. So, um, because if you're, you know, if you got some type of fund, you're getting some funds, you're properly funding it yourself. Or maybe you've gotten some small funds from like a bank loan or a business loan from a bank. Like, yeah, you're a startup. But once you get into that space of like, oh, we're a publicly traded company, like we it's it's a whole different ball game. But the idea of a startup is really looking for fast growth. Um, so when somebody says, Oh, I'm a startup, that means you're looking to grow exponentially, right? So like when I build this product. I expect for it to go from a user base of one to a hundred to a thousand to ten thousand to a hundred thousand in a matter of six months. Um, so, you know, that's typically the only way to do that is by leveraging technology. But it's not truth be told, it's not always the case that a startup uh, leverages technology heavily in order to grow fast. Um, it could be it can grow fast in a lot of other ways, too. So, uh, but yeah, startup, fast growth, fast paced environment, probably funded. Um, and that's typically what you're going to see out of a startup, probably funded, fast growth. Uh, and sometimes they might leverage technology. So that's usually what I would see is I would consider a startup. That's good. I can definitely see how there has been some, I guess, confusion of terminology or misusing terminology, um, especially once the iPhone was launched. Um, And I mean, everyone wants to be a startup because they're thinking about funding, they're thinking about investors and not necessarily what is a viable and sustainable um, business model for their product or service. Agree. And, And the funny thing about that is, it's like, you know, it's so many people out here trying to play the startup game right now. It's so many people playing a startup game and I get it. I love it. I love, you know, I'm all for it, but man, I don't think people, I think there are a lot of times where people really, um, really underestimate the research that needs to be done to find a viable business model or a viable product for a market. I, I really genuinely do, because when you start talking about startup, I don't think of the startup without thinking about like something like a concept like market validation. I mean, they, every business needs market validation. But for a startup, you really looking for uh, you really looking for market validation. Right. Like because the reality is, is that the last thing you want to do is go spend 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 thousand dollars on the application on some software that's supposed to power this business and nobody really want it or there's not even a need in the marketplace for it, which people do all the time, um, which is really crazy, uh, especially if you're not an engineer yourself and you're doing that. It doesn't it really doesn't make sense. Um, and I think there are a lot of stories out there that aren't being told of like a lot of these startups. When you think about a Facebook, like, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg was an engineer. 
Like he was an engineer, he was on the ground level with it. So like, yeah, his overhead was cut tremendously in the beginning. Like it, he he was playing a completely different ball game. Um, and then he started in the, in the scope of a, Facebook was so small at the time. It was really just relegated to his college campus or his uh, school campus at the time. It wasn't for everybody. So, um, and I know that's a product that he actually been working on since like high school. Um, so you, you got to think like people think these startups are like, they happen like overnight and they happen really quickly, but they don't even really understand the origin stories of a lot of these startups. Some of these startups are like engineer engineers that saw a need, or maybe they work for like even my own company, Elastic. So my own company is, uh, it was once a startup. Now they have valued it over, you know, I think what half a bill. Um, and, and the guy, and the guy shy who actually started it was an engineer at one point who saw, saw a need in the market and he developed a tool on the open source, open source mm-hmm. and he put it out there for everybody to use and companies, everybody started actually using the tool and bringing them in to consult them on how to use the tool, which is a business model that a lot of tech companies do. They'll build a free tool and then they will put it out there and business they'll and then the business will just pay the consulting fee for how to actually implement the tool. So those are, you know what I'm saying? There, there's a, a million ways of of slicing the startup cake. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, it starts with research. You gotta understand what you're getting yourself into. So there's you said a lot of good stuff. There's so many directions I want to go. Uh first, if Mark did not start Facebook in college. Do you think he would have been successful? If he didn't start it in college, I think he would have been successful. Who? I mean, it's Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, he would have been successful. He would have been successful because it's Mark Zuckerberg. That that's that's a that's a one in a billion mind, right? Um, you know, you can say what you want about whether he would have started in college or in high school or whenever, like. It's Mark Zuckerberg. Now, granted, the fact that he was younger and he was able to start on that at a, at a younger age, he had time on his side, right? And he understood that. So even if it would have busted the first time, the fact is he started so young that even once he got older, even if the final, even if the final idea wasn't Facebook, it would have still been something something else. He would have just took it in and, and retrofitted it into another idea. And that's something that a lot of engineers do. And the reason why I ask that, because I do feel like when you're in college, that is probably the best time of your life and the truest sense of community, right? Man. And I speak at PV every semester. And unfortunately, you know, the pandemic has happened. But I tell them, I'm like, you're a college student. You have people, you have resources that you can leverage. And if you want to go viral, you know, for the lack of a better word, this is the time to go viral. Right. Because things just amplify on college campuses that can't when you're an adult. So that's why I asked that question. Nah, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. If I were to do about tech when I was in college and I would have started doing tech in college, i had been a millionaire by now. Easy for sure. Like I say that all the time. And it's because of exactly what you just said. You don't get those. I, you like now that I'm 33 and I'm older and I and I and I understand the thing. You don't get that opportunity again, right? You don't get that opportunity of being young and having time. That's the most important, valuable thing you have. You have time, you have access to resources, and you have a bunch of people around you that also have time and access to resources. And as a result, what that becomes is you can, you can, you can take an idea and you can send it to the moon quickly. And even if it falls on his face, guess what? Nobody cares. Nobody's going to care in a year, in two years, in three years. If anything, people are going to remember, oh, man, I remember Reggie tried to do this idea and, da, 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 and I remember I was a part of it. They're going to still remember their experience of trying to be a part of, of that ride, if anything. So even if you said, hey, I want to take this and try to do it again here in the future, like you can do that because people are going to remember those experiences. People are going to have those connections with you. They're going to have those relationships with you. And you can't repeat that. Like once you get off into the world, people start having kids, and having families and getting jobs and parents getting older and all of this stuff start happening. 
and people don't have the time to even focus on that. They have to be incentivized, right? They have to be incentivized to, in order for them to actually move on something. And, and in order for you to get the proper resources to incentivize people properly, like that's going to take time too. So by the time you get another crack at it, you might be into your late 20s. You might be in your 30s. You might be in your 40s. You know what I'm saying? You just don't. Like it, it takes time. But the college is prime time. Prime time to get an idea off. Prime time. Because you start getting people in their 30s, people got careers and all of that stuff going on. So it makes it really, really difficult to get ideas off the ground. So you mentioned market validation earlier. Um, and I think I know one thing I've learned overall is just the MVP, right? The minimum viable product. Um, so what are some things that individuals should consider uh, when it comes to market validation of their product or service? Number one, the audience. Period. You got to understand your audience. You need to understand uh, who your user, what your user persona is, if you will. So understanding like, is this a product that's going to be for people that are between 18 and 25? Is this going to be for somebody that's between 25 and 35? You know, how much time do they have on their hands? How much how much uh, disposable income do they have on their hands? Um, you know, uh, how 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 often are, do you plan on them using this product? Um, is it something they're going to use daily? Is it something they're going to use weekly, monthly? How do you make sure they, they come back when it's time for them to come back? Um, you know, uh, really taking the time to understand who your user is, is it starts there. If you don't understand who your audience is, you're wasting money. Let me tell you that right now. Um, a step beyond that is really understanding the yellow tape. I think a lot of people, and, and, and I've seen this problem with, you know, uh, people that I've tried to help out on the side, a lot of people don't take the time to understand the yellow tape. So, for example, if you want to build a product for the healthcare services industry or something like that, there's going to be yellow tape that you need to understand. So if you're not doing your research, if you're not talking to the proper attorneys and lawyers, and all that people up front, if you're not doing the proper research on how to actually deal with this user data, what kind of security measures need to be in place for said user data, all that kind of stuff. Like you are going to get yourself in a bind. You will get him to like that is just point blank reality of the situation. So always making sure you're doing your homework on a yellow tape, understanding who the user persona is. Those are two big things. And I think the most important thing is, man, you got to have belief. If you don't believe in if you, if you, if you, if you don't truly, genuinely believe in this idea then nobody's going to believe in it, period. Like, if you have any type of hesitation or anything like that, any type of, I don't really know, you know, like, it's, it's going to fall on Def's ears. I guarantee it. Um, it's happened to me. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's happened to me. I have an idea, and the idea sounds great. It, it sounds great. But the thing, the one thing that I was missing was the belief factor. And if I'm not getting people to believe, it's going to be hard for people to want to jump on this bandwagon to actually see this thing all the way through. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, have you read Seth Golden's book, The Dip? I, you know what? I haven't read it, but it's on my reading list. So it's a quick read. I'll probably say I think maybe 90 minutes. And ever since I read that book years ago, I haven't been afraid to quit. Mm. because he, mm. talks about, he talks about you know you're pretty much your ups and downs right the downs are the dip um and i'll be like oh, okay i'm done with this <laughs> yo it <laughs> it be like that though it's like that though for real but you know what and I, no, I'm, I'm gonna let you finish your thought and then i'm, I'm gonna let you i think thought. for me um and not just professionally, but also personally, I've become in tune with myself mm -hmm. and I know when to take a break. I know even if I do quit, I've probably learned something. I may have made some money, a dollar, a couple of thousand dollars. Um, but for me, I always have momentum. Right. And I think that's the thing I hold on to. Even when I'm taking a break, I still have momentum. So I think that's mm -hmm. why I'm not afraid to quit versus when I was younger. Yeah, man. I think knowing when to say, knowing when to when the to, to throw in the uh, throw in the white flag, right? If you will, I think that's super important. I think that's 
Cause I, you know, ain't nothing like lingering on an idea for way too long. And, <laughs> and, and it start eating into an idea that could potentially be the one that gets you to where you're really trying to go. Um, and, and I've seen that far too often. That even happened to me before. That happened to me in my tech career. Cause I didn't start off learning tech. I was starting off doing photography and videography and doing all of those things. I just did websites and stuff on the side. And, and, and it had gotten to a point to where I was like, you know, I kind of want to see what this tech thing is about. I really want to try this thing out. And I felt bad because I was making money off of photography. I was making money off of videography. Like the month, like it was money coming in. Like people were try- calling me, trying to book me for stuff. But I kind of felt like with where I was at in my life, I was like, with where I'm trying to go and what I'm trying to do, I don't know if these are necessarily the vehicles that are going to get me to where I want to truly go. And because of that, I am willing to say, you know what? Let me just back out. Let me back out. Let me let me let me remove myself from these situations so I can fully put my energy into this situation. And I, you know, it's probably one of the best decisions I ever made. You know what I'm saying? It's one of the best decisions I ever made. And do I miss photography and videography? Absolutely. Do I feel bad that I, you know, I felt like I quit? Yeah, a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Because I think it could have worked out. But at the end of the day, it was in God's plan for me for this other thing to really take off. And this other thing manifested a lot of other things that I actually really what I really wanted to do with the other stuff. And they actually manifested themselves in different ways with, you know, tech for the culture and so on and so forth. So, yeah, like I don't think there's absolutely anything wrong with quitting and knowing when to throw in the uh, white hat, when the, uh, throwing a white flag, because the reality is this. That idea, that next idea could be the one. It could be the one. And you know if you made it to where you wanted to be. And if you haven't made it to where you wanted to be, then that means no ideas off the table. I like that. I like that. Okay. So tech for the culture. Uh, when did that idea come to you? And, and, what, and what is that about? Uh, so tech for the culture was an idea that came up uh about three or four years ago, um, whenever I was uh, actually exploring the Houston tech scene, when I was trying to, you know, really figure out what was going on. So I was going to a lot of different meetups um, and I would often be the only black person in the meetups. Um, <laughs> and, 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 it, and it just, you know, I had some pretty interesting experience of being the only black person at some of these meetups. Not to say that anybody was disrespectful or call me out of my name or anything like that. That never happened. However. Uh, you can definitely tell the energy is a lot different towards, you know, people of color. And, and, you know, when we come in and we want to ask questions, we want to do things, the energy is a lot different. And then on top of that, if if you are aware of anything that, if you are aware of the tech culture, imposter syndrome is a part of it. Imposter syndrome is a huge part of tech culture. And when you're Black moving into that space, it's probably that times 10 because you're Black moving into a space that's predominantly white men, Right. Um, and it be and it's usually older white men. Uh and and so you when you move into those kinds of spaces, like the imposter syndrome gets real because you're with these people that have been hacking computers since they were 14 and 15 years old, and I'm a this and I'm a that, yada yada yada, and all the kind of shit. Um and um and you know, it's just intimidating because you know you have a mountain to climb as far as knowledge and understanding is concerned. So uh, as a result, I ended up, uh, you know, we ended up creating a tech for the culture. We created tech for the culture, which started off as a meetup group where a lot of black people, you know, black people can come and we can gather and we can ask questions and learn about technology and things like that amongst each other. And not have to feel like the shame of of being the only black person in the room because there just was no space like that in Houston at the time. Um, and so that's kind of been the mission ever since. So. I mean, granted, well, let me say that the mission is definitely is, has definitely changed over the last year um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, but the, 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 the essence and the core of it still remains, which is having a safe space for black people who want to learn about technology and want to advance their careers. So you were able to make that transition from, I'll just say, a creative to a tech person. So how were you able to do that? And what advice could you give to people? Man, it was a whole lot of hustle. Let me tell you something. Um, <laughs> it was uh, it was it was an interesting journey 
because I'm self-taught. I didn't go to a boot camp. I didn't go get a computer science degree because I had a job and I had bills to pay. And I didn't see, it didn't make sense. I, I, did, I didn't want to go back to school and get into more debt. Like, well, I wouldn't, I never got into debt because I played basketball in college. So I, I, I had a scholarship. Uh, but I, I never saw the value of going into debt for something that does not necessarily guarantee me this net outcome on the other end. Um, I knew at the end of the day, from my experience in college, that getting a job and getting opportunity was more a matter of hustling than it was a matter of like the actual educational knowledge. Because I knew I knew a whole lot of people that were super smart in school that didn't get jobs. You know what I'm saying? But I knew a whole bunch of people that didn't didn't do that well in school, but they hustled and got into all kinds of positions. So I kind of took that mentality and was like, you know what, when I go out here, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the brains of all of these people that I meet and figure out what are these companies hiring for? What are these companies want to, uh, what are these companies looking for in, in a candidate, in an engineering candidate? And I took that and I started kind of creating my own kind of curric- curriculum to it, if you will. So, you know, I will go home, you know, I will go and do research. I will go find the the languages, the languages that were popular, what were the po- most popular languages? Um, and I would say, okay, cool. I'm gonna take this language. I'm gonna learn this. And what are the different tools that are associated with this language I'm going to learn? And then I will take that and I will say, okay, cool. Let me go out and let me go test my knowledge against these other more experienced engineers. And I will create these feedback loops. And so I was creating these feedback loops so I could figure out where my gaps were. So once I started figuring out where my gaps were and I started filling in those gaps, then what I would do is once I felt comfortable enough, I went and I would uh, volunteer at conferences. I would volunteer at conferences. I would volunteer at meetups. And I would just kind of put, I would expose myself. I would just expose myself and my knowledge. And eventually what happened was I met a guy at a conference that I had signed up for a diversity scholarship for. And we had met, we got cool the whole nine. And I had put in, I was putting in job applications too at the time. And uh, it just so happened to be that this particular job, the first job that I got, the guy that interviewed me was the guy I met at the uh, at the conference. So, you know, man, when I met him, it was like, yo, yo. And that was boom, like that, boom, you know, like swimwear. And that's how I ended up getting my first job. And I took that and I learned something from it, you know. And I just kind of took that same methodology and I just kind of continued to grow my career. And I went and worked for Home Depot and Schlumberger and Elastic. So, yeah, like it was really a matter of really finding people out there that were way that were ahead of me and and just picking their brain on what they were doing and what they, you know, what they what they were working on at work, uh creating a a learning plan for myself and then kind of creating feedback loops to kind of bridge those gaps, if you will. So you you said a lot of good things. I love your initiative um on how you were able to map out your career. When you started looking for a job, what were you going off of? Were you just looking based off a title? Um, like, how were I, you to? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so when I whenever I was looking for a job, so like, obviously, I started with a a, a skill set, right? I was kind of started with a skill set. I just because I knew at the end of the day, I needed to know how to program. That was just okay. In 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 game of it, right? But. But from there, what I would do is I, I would I, I once I had a solid skill, a solid foundation, then I would kind of would go and find out what these different opportunities were out in the market. And I would go and look at those job wrecks and I would look at some of the tools and stuff that they were using. And I would say, do I know this? Do I know how to use? You know what I'm saying? Like I kind of start figuring out like, all right, do I know this? How much of this do I know? If I don't know it, can I how long will it take me to learn or can I learn it at all? And um, and then I would just kind of take these job breaks because the funny thing is about these job breaks or some of these similar jobs is that they actually required a lot of the kind of similar skills. So like if you learn one skill for one job, you probably didn't learn that skill for at least four or five other jobs. <laughs> I think so. And that's kind of how my mentality was. And so I really was kind of like looking at these specific roles. So it might be like a, a it might be like a, a full stack engineer. Full stack engineer might need to be somebody that knows JavaScript on the front end. They might need to know Ruby on the back end. They might need to understand databases. They might need to understand these things. So, okay, cool. I know I know Ruby. 
okay, let me at least pick one or two other things that I can learn. And I'm a wing. The, and, and then the last one, I might not be an expert on, but I can at least say I know enough to go into the interview and be competent. And if I'm not competent or if I'm not good at it and I don't get the job, at the very least, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, give me feedback. If you can give me some feedback on what I'm doing wrong, that would be everything. And everybody will always give me feedback when I ask for it. And so I would just take that feedback. And once again, I would just add it to my feedback. loop. I'd be like, oh, OK, cool. Then this is what I'm going to do when I get home. And that's just what it was. I just rinsed and repeated because the thing with technology is the, the one thing I realized about technology and I just had to get married to it and program and taught me this is that you will fail. You will fail. You will fail. You will fail. Your code ain't going to work the way you expect it to. And at some point, you're going to have to debug it. You're going to sit down. You're going to have to triage through it. You're going to have to figure out what went wrong and all of the things. And eventually, you will move it into a desired state. But you have to accept that the, there, there's going to be some reconciliation period between where you're currently at, your current state, and where your desired state, right? And so the feedback loop is all about is this is this iteration of it going to get me to my desired state? No. Okay, why? This why didn't get you to your desired state. Okay, cool. Let's fix it. Boom. Now will this iteration get me to my desired state? Yeah, like and then eventually you're gonna get a yes. So this is all about really um like I said, those feedback loops, those feedback loops, those feedback loops. So like I will, like I said, I find that job title, I'm looking at that job title, I'm learning things according to whatever the job breaks are. And then I'm I'm going for it. I'm going for it. Like I'm going for it. The worst thing you tell me is no. Like that's, that's, that's the worst thing you can do is tell me no. So I know you're coming from a technical background. Um, I think lots of times we tend to become very hyper focused, and we'll think we'll go back to just tech, right? So we'll go back to the startup, right? So if it's Google, like oh well, it's Google. They need engineers. Not understanding what you said earlier, they still need HR, they still need marketing, customer service. Um, so what advice, um, maybe from your peers or colleagues that you picked up that you can share with us when it comes to uh, some of the operations, mm -hmm. or if you're a marketing professional, um, and how we can, how can we support the tech industry? Oh my goodness, there are so many ways. Like. <laughs> Like even in marketing, for example, right? The marketing efforts that that are required to get an app off the ground or to even keep people on an app are just tremendous. I don't think people really understand. Like I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you think you just you think you just know about Facebook because you just know about Facebook? No, that was a marketing team that put that together. There are people that put these things together, even if it's just word of mouth, even if it's just the way you design the application for certain features. That is a form of marketing. And I, I think people don't understand if they release a new feature and it's going, I'm going to get to enable you to go from, I get to talk to two of my friends right now to I get to talk to four of my friends right now. That's incentive. That's a form of marketing. That's a form, that's a reason to get somebody onto the platform. So there don't, I think one thing you have to, I think one thing people have to understand is that marketing has really moved into a space where it is no longer traditional. Contemporary marketing is really where it's at. Like marketing has completely changed its model because of technology. Technology has empowered it to do things that we have not been able to see. And then on top of that, marketing is now actually backed by data, which is the biggest thing, right? So now that you have this data and now that you have this technology that you can use to market in these new and unique ways, like the the possibilities are endless. The possibilities are endless. And truth be told, you could even see it in your own life. Like even if you were to take uh your own Instagram profile, like and this is these are things that I've done. Like you could take your Instagram profile and you can change it to where you attract exactly what you want to attract. Right. You could put exactly the kind of energy out there that you want to receive back. And I did it with my tech career. I put out, I would go on Instagram and I would talk tech and I would do this and do that, da 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 da, and go on YouTube. And guess what? People found me. I marketed myself. I knew exactly 
what to put out there to get the right people to pay attention. Um, and, and, and that's one of those things where that's kind of like some quick game, like some quick game for people out here. Uh, you know, the best marketing is the marketing where I'm, I'm calling somebody else and asking them, hey, are you interested in me? Or I'm putting a resume out there and saying, hey, can you hire me? The best marketing is the marketing where I get them to call me. It's an inbound call. That's the marketing you want. That's the, that. That's really what you want. You want to work smart, not hard. So if, if, if you're trying to go into any type of role, right, whether and it's a non, let's say a non-technical role into the technology industry or anything like that, the best thing you can do is really position yourself as a as some type of expert in some type of niche area, right? So maybe maybe you're an expert at at marketing rap artists, or maybe you're an expert at at marketing, you know, a uh, business like uh, you know small daycares or something like that. And maybe you are out here creating content that says, you know, giving great information on how to how to take you know make sure your your baby is healthy and things to check for when they get sick. Or, you know, these are great diapers that you should check out. Here's some new formulas that are out that are more health conscious. Here's some things. You just put that information out there. Keep putting that stuff out there. Eventually what's going to happen is there's going to be some company out there that's going to say, man, we need a marker that does, babe, you know what I'm saying, that knows how to, to, to market to, to daycares or something like that. And they're going to go on Instagram. They're going to put in daycare. They're going to put marketing. They're going to put in some stuff like that. And guess who po- profile going to pop up? Yours. So guess who's sliding in your DMs? Yours. And that's how it goes. My jobs that I've gotten is not because I put a resume out there. It's because I branded myself as something. I branded myself as a, as a cloud this, as a cloud that, as a blah, 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 blah. And guess who slid in my DMs? The recruiters start coming in. All the HR people start coming in. Like, now I start sending messages on LinkedIn all the time. That's how the game works. Like, marketing, like, Netflix, Netflix don't have to go out and tell you, hey, you know, <laughs> you want to you you want to spend ten dollars on watching what we got. What they're going to tell you is it's like, hey, man, we got this new TV show that's coming out. And it's going to be fire. It's only available here, though. And that's how the game go. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to go call. You're going to make some calls. Hey, you got a Netflix account that I can use. Uh, uh, who got a Netflix account? Mama, cousin, brother, sister, whoever, and they got you where they want you. They got you exactly where they want you, and that's the game. Like they didn't have to go and ask you to come and join Netflix. You went out and figured it out on your own. However, you got there. Why? Because they just they created the content and they made it attractive for you to want to come. And you have to treat your you have to treat yourself the same way. You have to treat your career the same way. I got to make it attractive for somebody to want to come and see this. I want somebody to come and see the Reggie show, you know, and that's what it is. So, you know, making really position yourself as, as an ex, even if you're not an expert, just being transparent works too. You know what I'm saying? Just to having the same, putting it out there and saying, Hey, this is what I want to do. And put the energy out there and for people to come in and follow you and support you and so on and so forth. Like that's what people want. That's that they want to see that you already have, put forth the energy that they were they would already want to see in their candidate companies don't want to work hard if anything like it's like the music it's like the music industry now like don't a record label want to ain't no record label out here about to uh, develop no artists no more what they about to do is they're gonna find somebody that got a hundred thousand followers that already got people rocking with them that like them that like the people already like their music and they're gonna come in they're gonna say hey here this is how much we can pay you that's the game. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> That's true. I mean, companies don't even train anymore. That yeah. No, yeah. they don't. <laughs> they don't. They're gonna bring in somebody that already did the work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're born and raised from Houston? No, I'm I'm actually from Dallas, D Town, Triple D. Oh, okay. Really from Arlington. Let me be specific. I'm really from Arlington because people in Dallas might be like, "He ain't from Dallas." No, I'm from Arlington. I was there this weekend. Um, so those of that are listening, well, we're recording this on June 28th. So yesterday was June 27th. So Houston holiday. <laughs> um, RIP yeah. DJ Screw. 
Uh, so what is it about Houston that you love, I guess, beyond work? Man, the food. <laughs> the, food is not, the food is better. I even hold you, man. Houston, I, and I tell you, I'm a foodie. I'm a big time foodie. Um, let me tell y'all something, man. Look, Houston is the best food city in America. I will say that proudly. I've been to the New Yorks. I've been to the Chicago. I've been to, say, I just got back from the Bay. Um, LA, Miami, all the places. Don't nobody want, nobody's touching Houston's food scene, period. 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 Because here's the thing, every other city is, they're, they're known for like, they have their thing. Houston has things. Like Houston has like, I, you know, it can be Middle Eastern, it can be Asian, it can be soul food Southern, it can be vegan, it can be dessert, it can be bakeries, it can be Mediterranean, it can be whatever you want it to be. And it's all because Houston is culturally the mo one of the most diverse, if not the most diverse city in America, period, because those communities really are here. They're living here, they're, you know, and they whole families came with them. So, you know, you got all these mom and pop uh, Mexican restaurants, mom and pop um, Mediterranean restaurants, uh, mom and pop kosher, like all of that stuff, man, these communities, like they get out here and, and the beautiful thing about Houston is they support small businesses. And that's why I think that's that's why the food scene is the way that it is, is that not only does the city support small businesses, but they support being in a diverse community and they support uh, and they support, you know, supporting small businesses. So you'll see a lot of people from other cultures going to all of these different places, going to all of these different restaurants. And like you see the fusion, you see the thing. So I think food by far is the reason why I love you. Like it, it's not even close at this point. Do you think the Houston tech scene has become more inclusive since you started back in the day, making that transition to, and now that you're in it? No. No. Um, mm -mm. Oh, man. Mm -mm. I don't think so. Here's my issue with Houston. And I've said this. I've said this to people at the Ion and so on and so forth. Here's my Houston issue with Houston. There's so much emphasis on the entrepreneur. There's so much emphasis on the entrepreneur, which I think is I think is important. I think it's important. Um, but my issue with that from, from a black community perspective is, is especially in the tech industry, if you got all of these black owned tech companies out here, but you don't have any black tech workers. What was it all for? Because if at the end of the day, I still got to go out and hire Middle Eastern and Asian and, and Caucasian and European and everybody else. So just no knock on them. They actually, they are great. It's great engineers the whole night. I'm not knocking them at all. However, if you go and build this tech company, a black owned tech company, and you don't have black workers, then it really defeats the entire purpose to me, right? Because the whole point was to create opportunities for other people, to create opportunities within your own community. If anything, equip your own community with the skills and the fortitude and the aptitude and, and all the things so that they can come and work for the black owned company. So that now, not only are you making money for the, the company, but you're paying your community, right? And they're taking them dollars and they're spending it in their community. And if you put too much emphasis on going out and just being a boss and not going out and raising workers, then what are we talking about? That's real. And that's and that and that is my and that has been kind of my crux. That's kind of been my 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 issue with the with the Houston tech scene a little bit is is too much emphasis on the entrepreneurship and not enough on like how do we get these skill workers up so when these companies pop we got people there ready to go to go work for them and then you paying your people and you doing the whole nine like and that's why I see that's why I have so much passion for a tech for the culture or something like that right that 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 space in the community because it's like everybody doesn't want to go and be an entrepreneur 
Yeah. Some people want the 401k. Some people want the benefits. Some people just want to be a part of a company that IPO so they can go off and take their money, go do their thing. Like everybody doesn't want to just be a boss. <laughs> everybody don't want to go and start their own company. That's a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice. I know you were in Atlanta not too long ago. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's one of, do you think Atlanta's community building is better than Houston? Therefore, they have more leverage in that area. Mm -hmm. Atlanta and Oakland, Atlanta and Oakland, for okay. sure. Those are the cities. I would definitely say that, that they figured it out because I just got back from the Bay and I, I was in Atlanta for a week and I was in the Bay for a couple of days, right? So I've been to both cities and spent time in both cities to see kind of like, okay, what's going on? Talk to people the whole night. And, um, you know, that's one thing that they, they have gotten right. It's not just about the entrepreneur. It's about the worker too. You know what I'm saying? It's about the developer too. It's about the UI UX person too. You know, like I want the black UI UX uh, designer. I want the black engineer. You know what I'm saying? I want the I want the uh, black database uh, administrator. I want the black cloud engineer because guess what? It don't just it's not just the it's not just the entrepreneur with an idea that makes this thing tick. Yeah. You know, so it, it's a it, it's a community. It's a it's a whole it's a whole uh, ecosystem mm -hmm. that you have to build, right? Um, and, and when you, when you kind of think that way, when you understand that you're building an ecosystem, you're not just building a business, you're building an ecosystem, right? And you make that ecosystem conducive to your culture and to those people is going to make for a better situation. It's going to make for a better business. It's going to make for, it is, it's, it's going to propel you forward. Um, if you will. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely say Atlanta and, and Oakland kind of figured it out because they have put emphasis not only on the entrepreneur side, but they've also put emphasis on the actual uh, skill, skill worker side, too. Yeah, my brain just churning with so many things. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's good. I'm, that made me feel good. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I don't I don't want to take up too much time, but I think um, you're right, right? And then it gets into, because part of me is like, okay, does the individual want to learn this? If the Can the individual make the, the Black individual make the decision to learn this? Um, are these resources created for them to go to it, right? Um, and then the funding to hire Black professionals, right? Black tech professionals to create your own personal ecosystem, or whatever your product or service is. So I, I, I have so many layers going in my head um, right now with everything that you just said. That's amazing. That's dope. I'm happy. I'm happy. I, I got the I got the wheel spinning. You know, that's what these conversations are for. If you know what I'm saying, if you don't, if you're not coming out thinking like, man, I, I never thought of it like that, then what's the point? Yeah. 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 So I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna get to follow up and talk about funding, right? Because that's that's <laughs> always a gap that's that's missing, um, how to get to the money and hopefully being a good steward of the money that you can hire a black team, a well-qualified team. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what else? I mean, is there anything that I missed? Any last tidbits that you want to sprinkle us with? Um, any last tidbits I want to sprinkle y'all with? Um, you know, for sure, uh, follow Tech for the Culture. Go to techfortheculture.com. <laughs> Go to techfortheculture.com and uh, join our community. Check us out, man. We're all about uh, growing and helping uh, people of color to advance and, and improve their careers in technology. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is uh, for everybody that's just listening, man, um, thank you and just believe, believe believe man believe write it on your mirror write it on your hand write it in your notebook man if you got a goal if you got a vision if you got something that you're really trying to go after man like write it down and start reverse engineering it man because at the end of the day man you you know we only have so much time we really only have so much time and and there's something that you're trying to achieve man go for it you know what i'm saying live life with no regrets at least if you at least if you go for it and you fail you and you can say at least how you went for it and you failed, right? Yeah. But uh, believe in it, you know what I'm saying? Believe in it, believe in it, you know what I'm saying? Because you never know, you know what I'm saying? You could be the one, you could be the one, you could be that next, 
that next person to do it. Uh, because if I didn't believe in 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 my vision to get into technology and a whole nine, like I I wouldn't be here. You know what I'm saying? And now I'm here and I'm able to help people. And I'm in a position to help people. And it's it's a beautiful thing. But it all started with me believing that I could get in. Like, I'm going to get in. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get in. I'm going to knock on as many doors as I need to knock on to get in. And then when I get in, you know, I'm going to do whatever I can to learn what I can and spread that knowledge and, and help other people. So believe, believe, write it down and go for it. I love it. We're definitely going to have the Tech for the Culture links in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. Uh, Reginald, thank you. It's another great episode. And um, yeah, I'm happy. All right, y'all. Peace yeah. and blessings. <laughs> Peace. Thank you for listening to Marketing for the Culture podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe, whether it's on Apple, Google, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. And of course, our videos are on YouTube. If you have a moment, feel free to give us a rate, review, or just comment. We appreciate our sponsors for their continuous support. Also, if you're interested in learning more about our sponsors or becoming a member of the African American Marketing Association, visit aa-ma.org.